الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله العليم الخبير المتقن النظام العالم بلا معين ونصير فسبحان الله الذي حكمته بالغة وعلمه غزير ونعمه واصلة إلى كل صغير وكبير ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له في نقير ولا قطمير ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله الذي هدانا بكتاب منير ودعانا إلى الله بالإنذار والتبشير صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ما دامت الكواكب تسير أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد نعلم أنك يضيق صدرك بما يقولون فسبح بحمد ربك وكن من الساجدين وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ It's always a pleasure to connect with the Riz family. And every time we meet, another year has passed and rapidly time is moving on. The focus of our topic today is finding solace in the book of Allah. I doubt there has been a period, time or era in human history where such a large multitude of people have been gripped by sadness, gloom, and depression. Any person and every person you meet at some point or the other is a victim of advanced level of depression. And today I'm going to share with you some of the causes of our depression and the psychology of the Quran and understanding what the Quran has to offer us to undo our depression. Often in the world in which we live, those that ought to provide us the solace, unfortunately, they compound and exacerbate the problem. There was an article of a country in Africa, and I was just reading the report, in which it was found that the anti-corruption unit was the most corrupt. Right? They say there are two things that can cause havoc to a person's life. In Urdu, they say, Do cheese admi ko pareshan karti hai. Ek uske khialat, dusre uske halat. There are two things that can just cause absolute havoc in your life. One are your thoughts, and the second are your circumstances. And nowadays, people have long showers, so they have extended thoughts. The shower is running, and you know, I had this thought in the shower. And often it leads to insomnia. Sleep is a very strange thing. If you get it, it helps you to forget. And if you don't sleep, it helps you to remember. The Arabic poet said, Sahirat uyunun wa namat a'yunu fi umurin takunu awla takunu fadra il hamma'anin nafsi some people, because of the precarious political climate, because of the instability, because of the predictions of the economists, some cannot sleep, others cannot get up. Some cannot sleep, some cannot get up. Fi umurin takunu awla takunu. It might go this way, it might go that way. Fadra il hamma anin nafs. Fadra il hamma anin nafs. The poet says, shrug your shoulders and just drop this whole burden on you. Fahimlanu kal humu majununu. You've become a vessel of depression which is tantamount to insanity. Inna rabban kafaka bil ams. Ma kana sayakfika fi ghadin ma yakunu. The Lord who took care of you yesterday has not become dormant or inactive today. He's active and he's alive and he will rescue you. So the first cause of our depression today in the world is overthinking. In English they say, control your thoughts, it might break into words. Control your thoughts, it might break into words. Overthinking is the biggest cause of depression. What has the Quran got to offer us to combat this and address this thing which has gripped us, plagued us, and in many stages incapacitated us? A person has a healthy body, but he has a depressed mind, and he cannot move, he's immobile. So there's an amazing incident, and I want to focus, you know? 
I always say, the Quran is for yourself, not for your shelf. The Quran is for yourself, not for your shelf. The tale of the mother of Moses, peace be upon them both. So the prophet Moses is born at a time which coincides with the decree of Pharaoh to cold-blooded, mercilessly kill children. And again, Pharaoh had dominion, a kingdom, and an empire. A fortune teller tells him that a child will be born, yuladu mauludun, yadhabu mulkuka ala yadihi, you will lose your empire at his hands. Historians write, the day Pharaoh was told this was the last day he had a peaceful sleep in his entire life. Well, the child is not born, even if he had to accept this, he's still not born, sleep peacefully. When he's born, when he grows up, when he becomes the threat, then you can become insomniac, but why from now? One thought and it crippled him, it paralyzed him. And that's the reality of the world. Some people never heal because they stuck in their minds, replaying corrupted scenarios. It's toxic, release it. It's toxic, it's giving of negative energy. So Allah told the mother of Musa that ila ummi Musa an ardi'i, that nurse your child, suckle your child. فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي That when you fear that the intelligence of Pharaoh will locate your child, then drop him in the river Nile. Now, listen to this very, very carefully. Then Allah categorically, explicitly, unequivocally says to the mother of Moses, لَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي don't fear, don't grieve. That's a categoric, explicit prohibition. The scholars of Tafsir raise a question, how do we reconcile this prohibition of the Quran against the verse of the Quran, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها, that Allah does not task a soul beyond his or her capacity. No human grieves by choice. Nobody is afraid by choice, you know, like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm deciding to be sad. I, I think I'll be a bit anxious. No, you gripped by fear, you gripped by grief. Yet Allah says, don't fear, don't grieve. So how do you reconcile? And this is a mother dropping her child. And this is the psychology of the Quran. And that is why I say it is a book of solace. The scholars tell us, the answer to this is, when Allah told the mother of Musa, don't grieve, don't fear, when both these emotions are non-voluntary, they overwhelm you, they overpower you, they grip you, it means that fear and grief by inception are non-voluntary, but by continuation, they are voluntary. So initially, you're gripped by fear. There is a fear that's lurking, it haunts you, it bothers you, it consumes you. Now it's within your choice to entertain it, to dwell on it, to allow that to overpower you or to suppress it and contain it. And that's precisely the meaning of the prohibition to the mother of Moses that don't fear, don't grieve, don't allow your fear to overwhelm you, paralyze you and incapacitate you. And what should you be doing? In psychology, think of positive things, give positive energy. Inna radduhu ilayk. Inna radduhu ilayk. We will return him to you. Think positively, think positively, give off positive energy. We will return him to you. Waja'iluhu min al mursaleen. And this toddler, this infant, that is sailing in the river Nile, will grow, will evolve, will mature, and will become one of the greatest prophets in the galaxy of Ambiya on the day of the, um, in, in this world itself. So the first message is that the Quran teaches us that this negative thoughts, we need to actively suppress it and contain it and not dwell on it, allowing it us to consume us and overpower us. That's the message and that's what we need to actively do. They say every time, psychologists tell us, 
every time you recall a negative event of the past, your body produces the same chemicals it produced at the time of the event. That means you relive the trauma of that incident a thousand times simply because you did not let it go. Simply because you did not let it go. What they say? Jab hum chote te, to baate bool jate te. To log hume kehte te, yaad rakna siko. Ab bare ho gaye, to har baat yaad rehti hai. Ab log kehte hai, bool na siko. Jab hum chote te, jab hum chote te, to baate bool jate te. When we were kids, then we were negligent, we were clumsy, we were heedless, we were oblivious, we used to forget things. Then people told us, you need to be matured, you need to be methodical, you need to be circumspect, you need to be calculated, you need to register, you need to commit it to memory. So then we grew and we evolved and now we remember everything. Now people tell us, learn to forget. Learn to forget. How much are you gonna remember? Drop it, let it go. So what's the first message? The first thing that paralyzes us is our negative thoughts. The Quran teaches us, suppress it. We, have a we don't have a choice when the thought enters us, but we surely have a thought to entertain it, suppress it, or contain it. And let me develop on that. There's a profound hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and we're living in a world of intellectual apostasy. We're living in a world where this is a reality on the ground. So the Prophet ﷺ says, يَأْتِ الشَّيْطَانُ أَحَدَكُمْ The devil comes to you and he whispers in your ear. And he says, مَنْ خَلَقَ كَذَا وَمَنْ خَلَقَ كَذَا Who created the sky? And you say Allah. And he says, who created the earth? And you say Allah. And then he says, who created the mountain? And you say Allah. Then he comes to you and you say, وَمَنْ خَلَقَ رَبَّكْ And who created your Lord? This is a categoric hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So he starts off, who created the skies? You respond, the earth, you respond, the mountains, you respond. And gradually he makes a niche and an opening and an infiltration and an indoctrination. And then he whispers in, who created your Lord? فَإِذَا بَلَغَهُ فَلْيَسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهُ وَلْيَنْتَهِ When you see that thought set into your mind, then immediately seek refuge in Allah and desist from focusing on such a thought. فَلْيَنْتَهِ The scholars say desist, desist. You cannot desist from the whisper because that's outside your control. That's how it's going to plague you and rock you and, and create anxiousness in you. But desist on magnifying it. Don't entertain it. Don't give it prominence. We move on. The second condition that creates a lot of depression in our life today is that every one of us at some point or the other have been violated, insulted, offended, betrayed by either a spouse or a child or a neighbor or a colleague. And that's the world in which we live. They say, Asal wafaye to peach, Asal wafaye to peach, peache hoti hai. Onna samne to kutta bhi dum hilata hai. Asal wafaye to peet peeche hoti hai. Warna samne to kutta bhi dum hilata hai. The real loyalty is behind my back, in my absence. Were you faithful? Were you honest? Were you in, did you display integrity? But in my presence, if you claim loyalty, well, even an animal is loyal. Even a dog is faithful in my presence. Even an animal is loyal. But behind my back, in Arabic they say, that al wafa shajaratun jami'u thimariha tayyiba wa ziwajun bila wafa'in ayyamuhu qalila. That loyalty is a tree that only bears good fruit. And a relationship bereft and devoid of loyalty is short lived. So another cause of our depression is I just cannot make peace what my spouse did to me. I cannot for the sake of me imagine how nasty, how obnoxious, how evil my in laws were to me. Some point or the other, every human has been on the receiving end. What has the Quran got to offer us as the book of solace to undo that depression? 
And I promise this entire audience, if you take this one lesson from my entire address today, this is the greatest psychology that I have come across in all the books I have read, and after all, it's the book of Allah. So there's no need to express and elaborate that it is, it would surpass every book of psychology in every regard. So here we have the tale and the narrative of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. None could possibly be violated, offended, and insulted to the extent that he was violated by his own siblings, by his own family. They kicked him into the well to the extent his dad lost his vision. They fabricated a tale. Time moved on. The scholars have two views. The separation was either 40 years or 80 years. The body freezes beginning to imagine the magnitude of this infliction. Comes the day where the secret is divulged and the reality is now unveiled and the brothers meet one on one and to take you direct to the tale and share the psychology and the message of the Quran to move on, move on. Don't, don't, don't stagnate, don't let this bring you down. You yourself are responsible for your happiness. If you're waiting for someone else to make you happy, you will never be happy. You yourself are responsible for your happiness. If you're waiting for someone else to make you happy, you will never be happy. Understand that. So here they come to Yusuf alayhi salam. Inna anta Yusuf. Uh, your majesty, your excellency, are, are you Yusuf himself? Right, I'm expediting and fast forwarding. The whole context needs to be appreciated. He says, Ana Yusuf wa hadha akhi. Yep, indeed, I am Yusuf, and the, this is my brother. Now, they gripped by guilt, embarrassment, they are ashamed, they are humbled, they don't know what to do, they drop their heads in embarrassment. So he recalls the vision he had as a lad. He says, I had seen a dream and a vision when I was a kid, and today Allah has made that vision come to fruition, that dream come to culmination, that theory come to materialization. And I beg for your undiv this is a phenomenal principle of psychology. When I read that, I literally was screaming with joy to say, this is what the Quran has to offer us, if only we can access it. He said, Allah has been very kind to me that he has brought my family from the village life into the city. Allah has released me from the cell and the jail. My word, my word. When he highlights and magnifies the boon of Allah upon him, he says, my Lord has been gracious to me. He released me from the cell. Scholars of Tafsir say, he deliberately did not highlight the bounty of Allah in which Allah released him from the well, simply because the word well itself was contentious. It would insinuate the crime of his siblings. So he opted not to reference the well even in a positive context. Why? Because you talk of well, it's synonymous to the treachery of his siblings. So he could move on, he could release, he could move on. He was not held back. And then he said, وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ بِي إِذْ أَخْرَجَنِي مِنَ السِّجْنِ وَجَاءَ بِكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ نَزَغَ الشَّيْطَانِ فِيهِ تَلَطُّفٌ بِإِخْوَتِهِ Then he said, Allah united us after the devil disunited us. So in that was a gentle release of a sentiment that my brothers are somewhat innocent. It was the devil that exploited everything. What they say in Urdu, Pachpan ke wo din kya khub te, jab do ungliya jorne se dosti hua karti thi, ab to gale milne ke baad bhi munafakat nahi jati. Pachpan ke wo din kya khub te, jab do ungliya jorne se dosti hua karti thi, 
Those were the grand old days where you tapped your finger and you became inseparable friends till the end of time. Now you leave for Hajj, you are part of a common journey. You embrace each other at the precincts of the Kaaba, yet hypocrisy doesn't leave either of the two. Wo zamana ta, jab subah ke baad sham bhi hua karti thi, ab to subah ke baad seedhi raat ho jati hai. Ab to subah ke baad seedhi raat ho jati hai. Those were the glory days where there was morning, there was mid-morning, there was early noon, there was mid-noon, there was late noon, then there was evening. Now it's morning and it's night, it's just darkness. It's just darkness and there's nothing else. But here's the psychology, my brother and my sister. The Quran is a book of solace. He tells his entire siblings, La tathriba alaykum al Listen, folks, I've closed the chapter. I've turned the page. We're done with the 80 years of atrocities. Let's move forward. Let's talk something else. Now, we can argue here till the cows come home that he was a prophet and he was a spiritual man and he had divine inspiration and he had that spiritual stamina. But let's not forget he remains a human and a mortal. And when he's a human and a mortal, he contends with emotions like you and I. Where does a man master the courage to bury 80 years of atrocities by his own siblings in one breath without any hesitation, reservation, or apprehension? What's the thinking? What's the rationale? What's the motivation behind this? And that is precisely what I read in Bayan al-Quran, again, alluding to the psychology of the Quran. This is so profound. The scholars say, and Shakir Mani has made mention of it as well in Ruh al-Ma'ani, مَن نَظَرَ إِلَى الْخَلْقِ بِعَيْنِ الْحَقِّ لَمْ يَعْبَأْ بِمُخَالَفَتِهِمْ وَمَن نَظَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ بِعَيْنِهِ أَفْنَى أَيَّامَهُ فِي مُخَاصَمَتِهِمْ أَلَا تَرَى إِلَى يُوسُفْ حِينَ عَلِمَ مَجْرَ الْقَضَى كَيْفَ عَذَرَ إِخْوَتَهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ The one who looks at the atrocities of fellow humans through the divine eye of the Almighty, that everything is in the control of the Almighty. He could have prevented this, but he did not prevent it. Hence, humans are no more than instruments to the execution of the greater plan of Allah in my favor. The one who views the wrong, the happenings, the atrocities, the inflictions of humans through the deeper eye, through the inner eye, through the with foresight and vision, then he has the courage to close the chapter and excuse people because he makes peace. My Lord could have prevented it, but my Lord allowed it to happen. So that means in this there was good for me. And the one who views the happenings of people with the limited, the narrow, the apparent, the outward eye, he remains caught up in arguing and counter-arguing, in implicating others and exonerating himself, and he makes no progress. He makes no progress. So he's stuck in this situation for, the, for his entire life. But why did you say this? But how could you do this? But I'll never pardon you, but that's nasty of you. But the one who rises above and goes beyond he has the strength, the capacity to forgive. And that's the teachings of Islam, that you can rise above and forgive. I mean, look at this point. Where could you have ever heard in the annals of human history, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marries Zainab radiallahu anha to Zayd bin Haritha, who was his former adopted son. The tale is long, Allah speaks about it in the Quran. And then the union does not hold on and it gets dissolved. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam realizes that the only way to mend the heart of Zainab is that I will marry her and win her confidence. But listen to this. So now the relationship is dissolved, it's terminated, it's ended, a divorce has taken place, which by all definition is not pleasant, is not palatable, it leaves a bit of unpleasantness in the air and the atmosphere. And the Prophet ﷺ is now going to get married to Zainab, but take a guess what he does. He sends Zainab's former husband, Zaid, and say, you go to your wife, your ex-wife, and take my proposal. Unheard of. Generally, when a marriage breaks up, it's like, I want to see if he'll get better. I want to see if she can find better. Forget about it. You'll never, you can dream about it. 
And obviously for Zayd radiallahu, the honor that his former wife is getting, the Prophet of Allah, there's no honor that can match it. So Zayd has the courage and the strength. He goes to his former spouse and partner and wife, Zainab bin Tejahash, and he says, Abshiri ya Zainab, fa inna Rasool Allah yakhtubuke. Oh Zainab, I've come to give you good news and glad tidings. It didn't work out for me, but it's working out better for you. The Prophet of Allah, the paragon of Allah's creation is knocking your door, extending a proposal. فَهَذَا زَيْدٌ بِرَغْمِ مَا وَقَعَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ زَيْنَبْ Despite what had happened, the Prophet ﷺ sent him. Why? So that, so that we learn that لَا يَجُوزُ أَنْ يَكُونَ مَانِعًا مِنْ نُسْحِ إِحْدَى الزَّوْجَيْنِ لِلْآخَرِ Despite our differences, the heart needs to be clean. Fudail rahimahullah said, مَنْ أُوْتِيَ صَدْرًا سَلِيمًا لِإِخْوَانِهِ وَأَحِبَّائِهِ فَقَدْ تَعَجَّلَ شَيْئًا مِنْ نَعِيمِ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْجَنَّةِ Any person who's been blessed with a clean heart, tell him Allah has blessed him with a divine bounty of paradise on earth. There's the statement that I often quote and it gives me a shiver in my back. لَقَلْبٌ نَقِيٌّ فِي ثَوْبٍ دَنِسٍ خَيْرٌ مِنْ قَلْبٍ دَنِسٍ فِي ثَوْبٍ نَقِيٍّ My brother, it is better for you to have a clean heart in soiled clothing than to have a soiled heart in clean clothing. How can I forget that moment? It will live with me and it gives me nightmares till today. Two years back I was invited in London for Ramadan, South London to be precise, Crawley, the location. I arrived there on a Friday, the long fast, 19, 20 hour fast. I got into my hotel, slept the morning, got up for Jummah Salah, went for the Jummah prayer, led the Jummah prayer, came back, retired, got some sleep, and I had an address after Asr. I got into the masjid, and uh, the Asr Salah was at 8 p.m. After the Asr Salah, the entire congregation had converged, and I gave my address inching close to the Maghrib prayer time. As I concluded my address, I went to the rear of the masjid where there was a sufra and some basic edibles were presented for people to open the iftar. I'm sitting on the sufra. There's a brother sitting diagonally across me. By a line whose control is my life to this 20,000 odd people, I will never dare speak a lie. It's 8.59 on the clock and we are waiting for 60 seconds to tick by so that we can open our fast. And in that 60 seconds, I see this brother in front of me turning to one side and he collapsed. Immediately people rushed out, tried to get a pulse, tried to resuscitate him, revive him. The clock struck nine, the adhan was sounded, we opened our fast, we offered the prayer, paramedics were called in, and in 15 minutes we were told he has been pronounced dead. Some dream to pass away in a masjid. Others wish for a Friday, and some hope that they fast in, and others desire it's the month of Ramadan, and some walk away with it together. Suhoor in London and iftar in Jannah, a death to die for. Suhoor in London and iftar in Jannah. As the visiting scholar, I was asked to address the entire congregation because the whole masjid was gripped in somber. The next of kin were ushered in and I had to divulge and break the news, not an easy task. I set the brother down and then I gradually broke the news. Tears trickled down my eyes until today that I have that vivid memory in front of me. I said, my brother, nobody dies like this coincidentally. Share the secret of this man to me. He said, my brother's heart was a clean slate. He never harbored ill feelings for one human. There you have it. There you have it. Time is running out. The next cause of our depression is, we're living in a world where inevitably there are people that are going to be jealous. And he's nasty, and he's plotting, and he wants to curtail my growth, and he wants to stop me. What they say? Jab main chal nahi sakta ta, to log mujhe girne nahi dete te. Or jab se chal na sika, to kadam kadam pe girate hai. Jab main chal nahi sakta ta, 
تو لوگ مجھے گرنے نہیں دیتے تھے when i couldn't walk and i started taking my baby steps then people said oh save him he mustn't fall watch the little one hey take care and then i grew up and i could walk now everybody wants to drop me <laughs> when i couldn't walk everybody wanted to rescue me and finally when i grew and i could take and leap and walk and advance now everybody is out to put glass and thorns and drop me so it's a world we're not living in an ideal world it's a reality what does the quran offer you to deal with 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 those that harbor jealousy against you has the quran the book of solace got in english they say if you cannot control what's happening then challenge yourself to control how you deal with what's happening that's where the power lies did you hear that my brother and sister can you control the political climate no can you control the happenings and the emotions of others no so challenge yourself how you deal with what people are doing towards you that's where the power lies that's the reality they are jealous people in abu hamid ghazali said al muadhab alladhi la yurham wa la yazalu fi adhab daim li anna ad dunya la takhlu qatt an khalq kathir min aqranihi wa ma'alimihi mimman an'am allah alayhim bi ilm aw mal aw jah the only afflicted individual for whom there's no empathy and sympathy is a jealous person because the world will never be free of peers colleagues and others whom allah has not endowed more than you so if you grappling to deal with what allah gives others then you're going to be in perpetual misery and sorry i cannot help you because the only way to help you is to destroy others which is unreasonable and impossible and abu hamid ghazali said the worst of crimes is a long poem of imam of sayyidina ali radiyallahu anhu idha jitama'at al afat fa al bukhl sharruha wa sharr min al bukhl al mawa'id wa al matlu wa la khayr fi wa'd idha kana kadhiba wa la khayr fi qawl idha lam yakun fi'lu in kunta dha'i in kunta dha 'aql wa lam taku 'alima fa anta kadhi rijl wa laysa lahu na'lu وَإِن كُنْتَ ذَا عِلْمٍ وَلَمْ تَكُنْ عَاقِلًا فَأَنْتَ كَذِي نَعْلٍ وَلَيْسَ لَهُ رِجْلٌ أَلَا إِنَّمَا الْإِنْسَانَ غِمْدٌ لِعَقْلِهِ وَلَا خَيْرَ فِي غِمْدٍ إِذَا لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ نَسْلٌ I'm not going to endeavor to translate that. Anyway, Abu Hamid Ghazali said the worst of crimes is miserliness. But worse than a miser is a jealous person. Because a miser misers with the wealth in his pocket. and a jealous person almost wants to mise with the treasures of Allah he wants to mise with what Allah no like Allah don't give it to him no no actually not Allah he, no why what aaj log apne dukh se dukhi nahi hai dusron ke sukh se dukhi hai aaj log apne dukh se dukhi nahi hai dusron ke sukh se dukhi hai people are not depressed because of their own misery they depressed because of the prosperity of others so what has the quran got to offer you in the psychology the quran speaks about the munafiqin wa idha laqukum qalu amanna when they met the believers they said oh we with you we together we support you wa idha khalaw but when they turned away wa dhi hasadin yaghtabuni haythu la yara makani wa yuthni salihan haythu asma'u tawarra'tu an aghtabahu min wara'ihi وما هو اذ يغتابني متورع i'm not going to translate my time is not going to allow that so anyway what does he say when the munafiqin move away then the quran says out of jealousy azzu alaykum al anamil min al ghayb they bite their fingers out of rage ala manasafi in madarik al tanzil makes mention kinayatun an shiddat al ghadab wa in lam yakun thamma azzun it's a metaphorical exploration of intense rage and it doesn't literally mean the biting of the fingers so this is the world you cannot control but challenge yourself to control how you deal with it challenge yourself they are jealous people this is them in tamsaskum hasanatun tasuhum wa in tusibkum sayyiatun yafrahu biha the quran says if prosperity comes your way they depress and if adversity comes your way they clap hands in ra'uni bi khairin sa'ahum farhi wa in ra'uni bi sharrin sarrahum nakidi the arabic poet uh, echoed the same sentiments now what's the formula what's the psychology what's the methodology 
to undo this type of depression. You caught up, he's jealous, she's jealous, he's nasty, she's nasty, he's obnoxious, she's obnoxious, he's in ambush, he's trying to curtail, he's trying to do, what's the way forward? وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا عَلَىٰ عَدَاوَتِهِمْ وَتَتَّقُوا اللَّهَ فِي إِجْتِنَابِ الْمَحَارِمِ لَا يَذُرُّكُمْ كَيْدُهُمْ شَيْئًا The Quran says the way forward to undo the depression related to the jealousy of people is fear Allah and don't stoop so low by reciprocating the same behavior. By you fearing Allah and persevering, you be transferred into the divine protection of Allah. Now Allah deals with those that are jealous with you directly. Chapter close. In fact, one of the hukama say, إِذَا aratta is mentioned in the tafsir under this ayah, إِذَا aratta أَن تَكْبُتَ مَنْ يَحْسُدُكَ فَازْدَدْ فِي نَفْسِكَ فَضْلًا If you want to destroy your foe, your enemy, your opponent, then increase in good and continue performing and excelling. And that's the psychology of the Qur'an. Then divinely Allah will intervene on your behalf and destroy him. So the psychology of the Qur'an is don't stoop low, don't throw the same things, don't hurl nasty, condescending, inflammatory, derogatory, vituperative comments. Rise high, live tall, and then Allah will deal with him. We move on, time is, is going away very swiftly. Often the cause of our depression, and I'm giving you a cue and a, and, and a yardstick from the Quran, how to find solace. Often the cause of our depression, as I mentioned in my early comments, it's khialat and halat, thoughts and circumstances. You find yourself between a rock and a hard place. It's quite challenging, it's dark, it's, it's, it's thundering, there's lightning, the storms are high, the vessel is rocky. It's, it's looking turbulent out there for you. What's the psychology of the Quran to deal with that situation? I take you again to a verse of the Quran, and this time the tale, the narrative, the incident of the campaign of Uhud. I just marvel, I just marvel at the richness of the Quran and how universal are its applications for all time, eras, and period. So in the campaign of Uhud, we ought to know, and if you don't, then here's a moment of reflection to revise, that initially the noble companions had an upper hand and they were prosperous and they were winning the battle. But then, due to certain noble companions, may Allah be pleased with them, there was some misunderstanding in, in monitoring a particular mount, Jabal Rumat. They moved away and their relocation turned the demographics and the landscape of the battle and an apparent victory was now slipping slowly into a defeat. And this got them quite concerned. And again, this is a phenomenal principle of psychology from the Quran. So the Quran says, And remember, remember, you were gripped by a trial. قُلْتُمْ أَنَّا هَذَا You said, where did this come from? Why did this come to us? We were the Prophet of Allah, we obedient, we compliant, we obliging. Now, listen very, very carefully. And I thank you for, I know, people have been sitting here throughout the entire day. It's a long day. But this is great, profound uh, lessons of the Quran. So, they were complaining, or rather asking to be respectful and, and euphemistic in the context of what's been addressed here. Where did this defeat come from? This was their question. But the Quran, in its profound, impeccable, flawless, amazing, brimming with psychology, wisdom, and knowledge, addressing this said, and when you were gripped with a trial, not forgetting that previously you had inflicted double of this pain on your opponent, then you ask the question, where did this come from? The scholars, may Allah preserve them, tell us what is the wisdom of the interjection of the Almighty. I don't want to go into academic language and grammar here because it's going to become very sophisticated. But to simplify it and paraphrase it so that the message can be appreciated and, and embraced, that you ask the question, why did this happen? Allah interjects, 
that at that time when in Uhud you lost 70 of your men, don't forget that previously in the second year of Hijrah in Badr, Qad asabtum mithlayha, you had inflicted double of what you sustain in Uhud upon your opponent. They say the Sa'ya gives us a message of psychology to any and every person who's experiencing pain, difficulty, or adversity. Don't view your trial in isolation because that will lead to despondency. But view your trial in the greater happening of things and how much prosperity preceded it so you will realize that the current trial is insignificant in relation to the favors of Allah upon you. لا تجزع إذا أعصرت يوما فقد أيسرت في الزمن الطويل ولا تظن بربك ظن سوء فإن ربك أولى بالجميل والعسر يتبعه يسار وقول الله أصدق كل قيل فلو أن العقول تسوق رزقا لكان المال عند ذوي العقول Now, there's a key principle to understand here. When you are gripped by a trial, understand this very clearly, then don't view your trial, your affliction in isolation, but view it, and that's the psychology of the Quran. So Allah interjected, Qad asabtum mithlayha. Previously, you inflicted double. So remember, you had the upper hand, and that's the, that's the, the life on earth is an alternation. That's how it happens. However, when Allah favors you, then magnify the current favor and don't view the trials that preceded it. So you say, oh, sister, you are so blessed. Allah has given you good children. Yeah, but Shaykh, it was really difficult raising them. No, no, no. Focus on the moment. Enjoy the bounty. Appreciate it. So when the Prophet Yusuf was reunited with his brothers and they said, Tallahi laqad Allahu alayna. Oh, Allah has blessed you, and Allah has given you status over us. He didn't say, yeah, but I cannot forget the days in the well. Yeah, but rem he said, Qad manna Allahu alayna. Absolutely, my Lord has just been too kind. So what's the message? When a bounty comes, magnify it, live with it. Don't recall the tragedies that preceded it. When a difficulty comes, don't view it in isolation. View it in the other happenings of things. Time is running out. I want to leave you with the last reflection that creates depression. Each one of us at some point or the other has to part ways with a near and dear one, or we find ourselves in a situation where we lose our health, our faculties, our resources, our abilities, and at times it could be quite daunting and challenging, paralyzing and incapacitating, frustrating, and, and, and it leaves a person anxious. What's the psychology of the Quran in this regard? Allah says, ما أصاب من مصيبة في الأرض ولا في أنفسكم I'm gonna wrap up here, I'm gonna time is short, I hope I can go quick. Whatever difficulty comes your way, whether on yourself, on yourself, or in the world, illa fi kitab min qabli an nabraha, but that it was recorded in a book, inna dalika ala Allahi yasir, and it's easy for Allah. The article of faith and taqdeer is a great source of solace for a believer because it helps him to bring closure to matters because he knows his Lord has pre decreed it and ordained it. So Allah says, whatever happens to you, good or bad, understand that we've recorded it. So don't be conceited, inflated by your accomplishments. What they say, the one who walks up, wrapped up in himself, makes a pretty small package. The one who walks around, don't tap yourself on your shoulder, you might dislocate it. Don't be proud, inflated, or conceited about yourself because Allah wrote that achievement for you. And don't be depressed. How can I forget the day I was traveling and I was interviewed, I landed in London and again I was taken across by an immigration officer and you know recently I was traveling in a country and I went through security check and that was the best I ever heard where I was called aside and said, Sir, the machine has randomly selected you. <laughs> I'm like, wow, ma'am, that's a new one for me but we'll follow protocol. Anyway, we went aside, the immigration officer sat down, he interviewed me, he said, you look like a man of God, and you look like a very religious man, I appreciate your candid nature, and I appreciate your communication, 
I'm cognizant of the time that has lapsed. I'm ending, Brother Fauzan, Jazakallah Khair. Don't let me get depressed. We need to give solace to everyone. So uh, he says, you know what? I lost a daughter of mine. This is an immigration officer in UK I arrive, and the opportunity presents. And that's why I say, stand tall and stand high and present the deen. Can you guide me from your religion? And I gave him a summarized version of the article of taqdeer. I said, this is how we have it. We take precautions. But if something happens contrary to our will, then the Prophet said, don't say if, because the word if allows for devilish indoctrination. So the last thing that I mentioned in this regard, the Quran teaches us for solace is the article of fate and destiny. I'll leave you with those comments and those regards. Remember my sentiments I said, you yourself are responsible for your happiness. You yourself are responsible for your happiness. Nobody else can make you happy. In English, they say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at also change. Insan ghar badalta hai, libas badalta hai, rishte badalta hai, fir bhi parasha kyu rehta hai, kyunke khud nahi badalta.